today. I'm glad that you're here. If you weren't here, I'd be by myself. And that's no fun. I had a lot of practice of doing that. And uh, I enjoy it a lot more when you're here. Just to remind you of some quick announcements, uh, tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock here at the church in the Fellowship Hall is the Vacation Bible School Workers Meeting. So uh, if you've signed up uh, to be a part of that, or if you'd like to, you can still come to that uh, tomorrow night. Teen camp starts tomorrow morning, and Daryl and Betty are taking them to Camp Fun in the Sun in the Ozarks, and uh, just pray for traveling mercies, and uh, so <laughs> and uh, keep everybody safe. That's important. On Saturday, August 1st, is a work day for VBS preparation, and that's at 10 o'clock in the morning. VBS this year is Ministry Mystery Island Answers, and you can register online at cbfirstnazarene.org and click on children. Also, just remember, continue to give faithfully. You're done great, and we appreciate that. Uh, if you know people that are still hesitant to come and and uh, need to watch on on uh, YouTube or Facebook, they can do that. Help them out with that. And uh, remember to take some time. I think it's more important than ever before that every morning at 10 o'clock or sometime during the day, you take a Sela moment where you just pause and talk about the goodness of God. We need to be reminded. God is still on the throne. He's not wringing his hands. He has this in control, and we need to trust him with all of our heart. And so we're going to worship together today, and I hope that you're ready to come together and worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Come praise team. Would you like to stand this morning? Let's just get a little energized and stand up as we begin to sing together. His grace is sufficient for me.
remain standing as we go to prayer this morning. Some of the requests that we have is, first of all, we want to pray for Mid-America Nazarene University and College Church of the Nazarene. Uh, Dr. Paul Cunningham passed away Saturday morning, and so they're going through uh, just the grieving process of the founder of uh, college, or the pastor of College Church and the, the man who walked with God that planted Mid-America Nazarene University. And uh, for many of us, he was our four-year mentor. He guided us, preached to us. He and Connie loved on us and helped us. And so we pray for the family and the church. Pray for the teens that are going to camp tomorrow and VBS. Continue to lift up Connie Cannon. Evie had a good chance to visit with her uh, yesterday and she is doing well, but she needs a special touch and God to encourage her and lift her. It's good to see Kathy here today. She's back and we're glad about that. Uh, keep praying for Rob Kennedy and his recovery process. He's in physical therapy and dusty sales. And then remember to pray for those that uh, we know that have cancer, Amy, Mindy McCullough's friend, Josina and Karen, Jeff's friend, Naomi and Judy, who are our friends and neighbors. And then just uh, keep lifting up those that are working, Brennan, Barron's unspoken requests, and Frank and his son, Stephen, uh, Kim and Scott. Uh, Pastor Luis is doing better. He doesn't have the kidney stones, but he uh, is supposed to have surgery on his knee, but he has to be tested and all that kind of stuff, and he's not sure he wants to do that. He might want to limp the rest of his life, I guess. I don't know. But pray for him as he goes through that. And then uh, Frank Orton, as we mentioned last week, passed away. That's Lynette and Dan's brother-in-law. And the funeral will be next, uh, visitation will be next uh, Sunday night in Burlington and the funeral on Monday. So pray for them and, and just uh, lift them up to the Lord. And then I'd ask you to pray uh, for me. And uh, this week, uh, Evie and I are going to take four days just to try to regroup. And, and uh, so we appreciate your prayers as we, we do that. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today realizing that you are God. There is no other gods. You are God, Jehovah, the ruler of the universe, the creator of all. And you hold all things in your hands and you can work in all things for good to them that love God who are called according to your purpose. But Lord, you can be with College Church and Mid-America and the Cunningham family and all those that were close to Dr. Cunningham. And Lord, we just uh, thank you that he is with you today. He's no longer suffering from the, uh, Parkinson's disease. He is, he is free and free indeed. And we praise you for that. What we pray for Dr. Cunningham, we know is the same for Frank. He served you and worked in missions his whole life. He loved to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to world areas. And Lord, today he's going to get to celebrate and worship in a special way with many of those that he had the privilege of leading to the Lord down through the years. But Lord, we come today and we pray that you would touch and lift and encourage and strengthen. You have said your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Lord, there are some times that we know we're awful weak. And your strength does come through and help us. I pray that you would continue to comfort Connie, that you'd be with her in a special way. And I pray that you'd encourage Rob in the midst of this physical therapy and isolation and all the things that are going on. And thank you for touching Dusty. And Lord, just continue to be with uh, these that are suffering from cancer and those of us that are around them. And Help us to be representatives of you for each one of them. Thank you for this day and for this service and for the opportunity to gather in your name. Be with those that are traveling, 
and be with those that are chosen to stay home. And I pray that your spirit would go through and come out through the television and the worship program and touch their lives today. Thank you for the privilege of serving you, of loving you, of knowing that you care for us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, this ladies' trio is going to sing about the cross. You know, the cross is just a cross. It's just a piece of wood. It really doesn't have any magical power in itself. It's what Jesus did on the cross that frees us and allows us to be here to get today to have a personal relationship with him.
you, ladies. Thank you very much. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to one of the most powerful chapters in all of the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I just want to read through this chapter, uh, some of the verses of this chapter, because here's, what, here's the theme today. How would you like to be identified down through the pages of history as a personal friend of God? That's quite a declaration. A personal friend of God. That is the way Abraham is referred to in Scripture as a personal friend of God. A personal friend is one who's close enough that you can share real personal information with and do so with complete confidence. It's a person that you have utmost trust and respect and love in, in, in that relationship and you believe in their character. I was in a seminar not too long ago where a Christian psychologist said in a seminar he, uh, that I attended that most people do not have even one real friend. It's because the commitment and trust that is required prevents most people from taking that kind of risk. When you find a true friend, it is a gift from God that should not be taken lightly. And so today we're going to look at Abraham, who is called the friend of God, and I want to read to you some verses out of chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence or the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his, being, before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Key verse. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom he said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. The key verses in this passage are the ones that we've read, but the two that stand out every time you read the 11th chapter is the first verse. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things 
not seen. And verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. In this passage, in the verses that we've read, we see at least three reasons why Abraham was considered a friend of God. The first reason is found in the eighth verse. In the eighth verse of Hebrews chapter 11, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. In other words, Abraham trusted God completely with his future and put his faith in the character of God. Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. This is an interesting verse because in it we see that Abraham was a friend of God because he gave God total access to everything in his life. And the most important thing in his life was Isaac. It was Isaac from which all the inheritance was going to come, and yet God said, I want you to offer up Isaac, and he did so. He held everything before God with an open hand. He gave God access to everything in his life. He was a personal friend of God because in verse 10, it says, he was looking for a city which has foundations whose architect and builder is God. In other words, Abraham was a personal friend of God because he believed with all of his heart that God was going to keep his promises and his word, and he lived by faith. Let's walk through these three verses and reasons why Abraham was called a friend of God. The first one, Abraham was called a personal friend of God because he totally trusted in the character of God. I have shared this with you in times past, but it's good to be reminded every once in a while. So I want to talk to you just a moment about what this means, what Abraham said when he totally trusted in the character of God. I have told you that in the Hebrew language, man is in one position before God and he can never change it. That God and the language of the Hebrews puts man in a position before God that can never be changed. Now we're talking about a position. Here's what I mean. I'm going to give you some words. The first word is the word yamen. The word yamen in Hebrew means south or right. South or right. You got it? This is an easy one to preach in this, in this church. Because south is right. <laughs> okay? <laughs> the second one is shemol. Shemol means north or left. So as you stand before God, every person stands, their, the south is their right side, left is the north side. But here's the key points of this position of man. The next word is kadem which means east. It is also the word for past. Are you beginning to get it? Why is Jesus going to split the eastern sky? Because if he came out of any other direction, we would never see him. The only thing we know for sure is what has been. So we stand facing our past. Now here's the key. Ekor means west or back. So in the Hebrew language, every person is born into this world and the only thing they know for sure is what has been. Their future is behind them. That's why Isaiah said, you hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Abraham decided very early in his relationship with God that because all he knew was what had been, he needed somebody in the future that was already there, that knew what to do, that knew everything about the future, and there's only one source. 
It's not Ouija boards and witchcraft and all kinds of things like that that tells us the future. God's the only one that's in the future. So Abraham stood looking at his past, seeing all of the victory, seeing all the trials, seeing everything that he had experienced. But listen to me. He did not want to make the choices of tomorrow based on what he saw in front of him. If God's going to do a new thing in our day, we've got to release him from the past of our lives. We've got to say to him, you can do it any way you want. You don't have to do revival like you did in 1932 in the church in 1932. You don't have to come the same way. I see it in the past. I know you're working. But God, you're the God of the future, and you know how to lead us into the future in a brand new way. It is interesting in Scripture that God very seldom repeats the way that he performs a miracle. All through the Old Testament, God had different solutions. He had David and the slingshot. He had Saul and his sons. He had Jonathan. He had different people that did different things to provide the victory. Why? Because God's the only one in the future, and he's the only one that can tell us how to deal with it. If we try to live our lives based on what we see in the past, we are not going to be walking by faith. We are going to be walking by sight. And if we do that, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do you hear it? If the only choices I'm going to make as I walk with God are those that are similar to the ones I've made, I'm walking by sight. Abraham called a personal friend of God because he positioned himself. He knew the position he was in. He saw all of his past. He saw all the blessings. He saw all the praises, but he knew that he didn't have a clue what he should do about tomorrow. He needed a personal guide, Jehovah God, who is in the future, the past, and the present all at the same time. And so Abraham said, I'm going to trust in your character completely. So he went out from a land. Where are you going, Abraham? I don't know. How far is it? I don't know. How many provisions do you need? I don't know. Well, why, why are you going? Because God told me. And I trust in God's character. So I'm going to go where God wants me to go. Well, are you sure? Well, yeah. You see, Abraham was a personal friend of God because he understood the only thing, the only one that can direct him into the future is God himself. It's a matter of trust. That's why when we read Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. One of the things that, about faith that's hard for us to grasp is we want faith and we want trust in God for the future to be told to us before we get there. Just show me what to do. Show me how to do it. If you don't show me, I'm not going. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and, a re and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Can I tell you today, I believe we need a revival of believers living by faith and stop making the decisions about God and the church and everything else based on what has been. As I look back over my ministry, I, I don't see any duplicates. God has never worked in the same, in, in the same way in the churches I've pastored. It's all been different. Do you know why? Because he loves the people of those churches. And he knows them better than anybody else. And he only leads the church into revival in the way that they can handle it. He will not over, overburden us. He loves us. Abraham was a friend of God because he trusted completely in his character. 
Secondly, Abraham was a friend of God because he gave God access to everything in his life. I wish I could preach this like I feel. You see, I believe this is, this is the key to revival. When God's people humble themselves and pray and take everything in their lives and give it to God, then God can work. But if God's people humble themselves and pray and tell God what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, God says, huh, so be it. I'm out of here. I am not going to beat my head over a rock to get my people to hold things in their hands openly before me. If they choose to keep back their tithe, if they choose to keep back, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them do what they want to do. I will not fight with them. But they also will not experience my blessing, my benefit, the Holy Spirit. Their children will not experience it. And they'll be lost because they did not give me access to everything. Abraham's serious about this. You say, what do you mean he's serious about it? I mean, I mean, God's serious about this. He goes to Abraham after he has a boy born when he's 100 years old. And his wife's 90. And God says, I want you to take your boy up to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice there to me. Just think of all the excuses we could come up with. But Lord... I'm 114 now. Sarah's 104. We can't do this again. And you want to take my only son? And you want me to sacrifice him to you? But because Abraham saw his past and knew his future was behind him, he was able to take everything in his life and hold it up like this. And verse 19 says, He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Here's what Abraham believed. I'm going to do what God wants to do, but God's going to have to keep his word. And I know my God. I've seen him work. He never breaks his promises. He never goes back on his word. And if he's asking me to take Isaac up on the top of Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice unto God, I'll do it. Because I know my God then. I've done my part. I've been faithful. I've held everything openly in my hands. I've done my part. I'm going to let God do his part. And he never lets me down. And I can trust him. And he's going to do it. And I don't know how. Even if he has to raise him from the dead, it's all right with me. You see what he was saying? I'm responsible for me. I'm not responsible for God. Church, listen to me. If we're really going to know God, we got to quit trying to do his job. Because we always want to say, God, I'll do this if you do this. I'll do this if you do this. I'll do this if you do this. Come on. We've got to hold it loosely in our hands so that we do our part then God can do his. And he never breaks his word. And I guarantee you, he'll do it in a way that you never expected. And it happens over and over again. So Abraham was called a friend of God because he held everything loosely in his hands. Corey Ten Boom, I love reading uh, the hiding place, and I, I loved reading her story. She was a prisoner of war in World War II. She said, we learned in the prison camp that the best way to hold your most valuable possessions are in an open hand. She said, the minute we closed our hands, the guards thought there must be stuff of value there. So the guards would come and break our fingers and pry our fingers loose to get what was in our hands. 
But when we learned that we could hold all things openly, they don't, didn't seem interested. And it just, we learned to hold things loosely in our hands. You see the quote for, from her. Abraham learned to give God access to everything. Corey Ten Boom, of course, that was a prisoner of war, I understand, but what she's saying, it didn't hurt half as much unless she tried to hold on to it. Give God everything. Abraham was a personal friend of God because he gave God access to everything in his life. He held nothing back. Don't misunderstand me this morning. I believe that taking Isaac to the mountain to offer him to the Lord was the hardest thing Abraham ever had to do. But the fact that he did it meant that he was giving God access. And not only that, he was saying to God, now, I've done my part. You do your part. And I will tell you, there is no better place in all the world than to walk in the footsteps God wants you to walk in and do it and walk with him and come to the point where you can say, okay, I've done my part. It's all yours. It's all yours. Abraham was a friend of God. And we've already talked about it. We've talked about trust. Now we're talking about faith. Hebrews 11:6 and without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him and in verses 9 and 10 by faith he lived as an alien in a land of promise as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob fellow heirs of the same promise for he was looking for a city whose foundations whose architect and builder is God. Faith is the capacity to act, to believe, and then act on that belief. Abraham was letting his faith lead him. One of my favorite preachers down through history was Dr. Dennis Kinlaw from Asbury College. He was the president of Asbury. And I'll never give it the same... Uh, uh, neatness that he did in telling this story. But this is the way Dr. Kinlaw told this story about Abraham living by faith. He said, God came down to Abraham one day and sitting at the tent flap, he pointed, God pointed out to all the hills. And he said, Abraham, do you see those hills? Yeah. All those hills are going to be yours. Abraham, do you see the stars of the sky? Yeah. You're going to have more descendants than the stars in the sky. Abraham, you see those hills? You see those stars? And we're imagining that a CNN reporter came along and he's going to interview Abraham. And he sits down and he says, Abraham, I hear that you think you're going to have descendants. And you're going to, you think, what are you doing anyway? Why are you traveling across this land? Where are you going? I don't know. Well, how, how do you know when you get there? I don't know. Well, are you crazy? What's the matter with you? And Abraham takes him to the flap of the tent and says, see those hills? See those stars? My descendants are going to be greater than those stars. And I'm going to own those hills. And the reporter says to him, Abraham, how old are you? I'm 75. How old's your wife? 65. And you think you're going to have descendants like the stars of the sky? Yes, sir. You come back. Ten years later, the reporter comes back, walks up to Abraham. Abraham, how are you doing? Where are you going? I don't know. When are you going to get there? I don't know. How many provisions do you have? I don't know. 
What keeps you going, Abraham? Come with me. See those hills. See those stars. That's what keeps me going. I'm going to have descendants like the stars of the sky. How old are you, Abraham? 85. How old's your wife? 75. You're crazy, Abraham. You're just plain crazy. You come back later. And this goes all the way until he is 100 years old and the reporter comes back and Abraham's sitting out front of the tent making a baby buggy. And the reporter comes and says, do you know where you're going? No. Do you know when you're going to get there? No. Do you know how much it's going to cost? No. Then why are you doing this, Abraham? See those hills. See those stars. Abraham, how old are you? 100. How old's your wife? 90. What are you making there? A baby buggy. Why? Why would you do that? Because my wife's pregnant. See those hills? See those stars? Why was Abraham a personal friend of God's? Because he believed God and acted on that belief. He didn't have to answer all the questions of all the people. He didn't have to show everything. All he had to do is keep walking into the future with the God who was taking him there by faith. What's the key to being a personal friend of God? I believe it with all my heart, folks. It means that you trust in the character of God. You see how he's worked in all the ways in front of you. You rejoice over all the miracles that he's done and the ways he's moved. But you know that he's the only one in the future and you trust in his character. You hold everything in your life with an open hand and let him have access. Because by giving him access, it means that you say to him, God, I have walked in all the light you've given me. Now it's your job to make it happen. And finally, it's living by faith. Abraham was a friend of God because he walked by faith. See those hills? See those stars? That's God. So this morning, I just need to ask you, ask your pastor, it's important that you answer this question. Are you a personal friend of God? Would God call you a personal friend? Do you understand that the only one that can guide us into the future is the one who's already there? Do you trust in his character? Do you hold everything loosely? In your hands, will you walk by faith and not by sight with your back to the future? It's the only wise way to walk is to have a voice with somebody tapping on the shoulder saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. It's the only way to live. A personal friend of God. What a tremendous statement. I want to be that way. And I want to live that way. The praise team is coming and we're going to take the elements of communion today and I need to take a little bit more time to explain to you exactly what we're doing. We will pass them out to you but they will be in a cup and the bread all together. Not all together but all together. Use this at General Assembly and District Assembly. We want you to hold the cup until everyone is served. 
and then we will open the, the communion elements, take the bread, and then we will dr drink the juice, and we will take communion together. Shall we bow our heads? Father, we thank you today that we can be called your friend. But Lord, we're also thankful that you <laughs> are our friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to you in prayer. Lord, I pray as we take these elements today, help us to think about what it means to be a personal friend of God. That we trust in your character, that we hold things loosely in our hands, and that we live by faith, not by sight. Lead us now and help us in this communion time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Those that are coming to help me. thought a lot about even as a little child we learned that Jesus is our best friend and Amen. we can love Jesus and and that he's our friend but I'm not sure we spend a lot of time thinking about am I a good friend to Jesus am I faithful to him do I give him my best we used to sing a song give of your best to the master Give him first fruits of your life. But ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest privileges we have as human beings is to be able to be the friend of God. Amen. To live our lives as a friend of God. In this world where people are trying to connect themselves and disconnect themselves and do all things with all these different people, it's sure good to know I have a friend and he has a friend in me. So we're going to ask you today as we take the bread, we're going to remember his broken body that was shed for us, that he gave himself 
so that we could know him. And he was bruised and battered and beaten. And so we're going to take of the, of the bread today. You have to be careful on these, not to pull the juice open <laughs> with your, uh, I've already done it. <laughs> but just uh, break the seal for the first one and take the bread. Do you have the bread out? Okay. Take the bread and remember that Christ's body was broken for you and preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. You may eat the bread. Then take the cup. Whenever I see the cup, I think of the shed blood of Jesus. I think of Calvary and the shedding from the crown of thorns and the nails and the pierced side. And I realize without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That he had to do that so we could be his friend, so we could be cleansed from sin and filled with his spirit. So as you take the juice today, remember, Christ died for you. He shed his blood for you. He is your best friend. And you are his friend. You may take the cup. Father, we just ask today that you would make this a special time for all of us. Lord, we haven't preached an extravagant sermon. It's just simple. But it's powerful. It's your word. Thank you for the privilege of serving you and loving you. Thank you for giving of yourself that we might be forgiven. Thank you for being the best friend we've ever had. Thank you for letting us be your friend as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please just carry your cups with you and we'll throw them in the trash in the foyer. It'll help George out a little bit. And let's stand together as we sing the final song.
Yes, God bless you.